firstly, thank you for coming. We, we didn't know how many people we were going to get on such short a notice, but I see the house is completely filled out. So you guys have incredible taste because Cheryl is an amazing person to interview. And as you're going to learn about her, you're going to see that she's really an amazing uh, individual in many different aspects of, of amazing, I guess. So before we start, I want to give you an idea on what inside the mind of, because that's what the series is called. I want to give you an idea of what makes this different from regular interviews. So basically, in Mind Valley, we are a training company. We have about 2 million subscribers, and we help people with improving their lives through personal growth. Now, one of the models we use for personal growth in Mind Valley is a philosophy, a model that I designed called consciousness engineering. And it's designed to take people and make them grow in their potential really rapidly. Now, the model has two simple rules. It says that you can take a man or a woman and you can hack them and make them grander versions of themselves by flipping two different things about how they function in the world. The first is their beliefs about themselves and the world. So we take on these beliefs as kids, typically before, before the age of eight. Beliefs of what it means to be a man or a woman, how relationships work, how life works, whether entrepreneurs are good or bad, whether money is good or bad, beliefs on religion, our idea of God, of our nation, everything are simply beliefs. Nothing is true or untrue, but our beliefs make it so. So if you believe that life is primarily a struggle, you end up struggling through life. You believe that money is bad, you probably won't end up gathering much money if you also believe that you want to be a good person. So there's no belief that's right or wrong because every belief is individual, but beliefs like the hardware of a computer can be swapped out or swapped in. You can take a dysfunctional hard drive, you can take it out, you can swap in a functional hard drive, boom, your computer is completely different. Beliefs are swappable. That's the first rule. Okay, so what we're going to do in consciousness engineering is try to understand Cheryl's beliefs, her beliefs about what it means to be a Malaysian entrepreneur, what it means to be an entrepreneur who was incredibly successful in the US, what it means to be a woman. And from this, you get to learn and understand new beliefs. See, one of the fastest ways to grow someone is to infect them with more empowering beliefs. So I spend a good deal of my time growing myself, reading biographies of great people, or going out and getting to connect and interview great people, because these people have beliefs that infect me, and they override some of the beliefs that I grew up and took on that were not as empowering. Make sense? So one of the things you're gonna get from this, unlike other interviews, is an opportunity to see how Cheryl sees the world and to put these beliefs in your head. Now the second thing you're gonna get is something we call systems for living. All successful people have different systems. So how many of you here eat every day? Okay, we all eat, we all exercise. I hope most of you meditate, but all of these are systems that we adopt for living. We have a system for commuting to work, a system for eating. But as humanity progresses, more and more advanced systems get discovered. I mean, you've seen how just in terms of the dieting industry, right? At one point, it was eat a low-fat diet. Then it became eat a high-fat diet. Then it became um, a, a, a paleo diet or a low-gluten diet. It's so confusing. All of these are different, uh, are different systems for living. And in the world, new systems get created all the time. The books you read, the exercises you do, the way you approach work, the way you approach productivity are all systems. Mm -hmm. And what you're gonna learn here are the systems that successful people like Cheryl adopt in their life. So you will take away new ideas for books to read, new ideas for productivity systems you can bring in your life, new ideas for um, your exercise routine. All of that get discussed over here. Okay, so let's start with the questions, right? Now, Cheryl, we want to start with the first question which really defines you as an entrepreneur. At what point in your childhood or younger years did you decide that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Um, you know, I always thought that I, I've always been an entrepreneur because um, in my second grade, which is standard two, I, I started my business and uh, it got my mom to be my COO. I mean, I, I got her to make like, you know, butter suruman, five stones. Um, so all the kids in school were making flat. Do, do you know Batu Suriman? No, I don't. Five stones, you, you throw it in the air. Oh, yes, it. yes, I do. I all, do. All right. kids play that, all girls play that, right? So a lot of kids had pillow-shaped uh, Batu Suriman, and my mom made the pyramid-shaped ones. So they were superior to other kids. So they always wanted to play mine. Then I had a business idea, and I ran back to my mom. Mom, why don't you make them and I sell them? 
And so she, she agreed, and, and I started this whole business venture in Standard 2 and made tons of money, and then the teacher like basically said, you can't sell anymore. So, so it started there, I think, and my mom has always been really encouraging of my business ventures. And then you know I, I went to flea markets and sold my dad's old ties and cassettes and all kinds of junk. So and, I, and so and so that's really interesting. Yeah. Firstly, so you started your first business when you were eight years old. Yes. How many of you here started the business before you were twelve? It's it's a very kiddish business. It is, but what I noticed, which is really interesting, and I'd love for you to maybe shed some light on it, is that many successful entrepreneurs started a business when they were say under fifteen, mm -hmm. and it was often something very kiddish, yeah. right? Like, like, I had a business, I, I had two rabbits who um, shat a lot, and I tried to sell the rabbit poo as fertilizer to make money. Oh, wow. That, doesn't, that must have smelled terrible. It completely, it com <laughs> and, and then I bought, well, I, I had two rabbits, and one was supposed to be a guy, one was supposed to be a girl, and the idea was they were going to mate, create tons of rabbits, so my poo collection would grow, <laughs> and I could, you know, dominate, I guess, the rabbit poo industry. Turned out the guy who sold me rabbits sold me two male rabbits. Oh. <laughs> and that was also how I ended up learning about the birds and the beasts. Yes, that's now, great. what is it, so, but what was it as a child mm -hmm. that made you suddenly decide that you could make money selling Bajus Ramban? I don't know, I think I, so I'm the oldest kid in a family of three. So I have a younger brother and younger sister. And um, I'm, I'm always sort of just really, I've always been driven, I guess. Uh, and, and people ask where my drive comes from and I can't tell them why. I think part of it is, is you're born with it, kind of. Part of it is your upbringing. Part of it is the, the things that you learn as you grow up that changes your mind about, like you said, who, who your, what your belief systems are, right? But, but this is the one thing in me that I've had ever since I was young is this, entrepreneurial thinking, like I always want to um, think about different ways to optimize things. When I, when I do something, I will always find ways on how to do it cheaper, how to do it quicker, how do, it, how do you do it more efficiently. So, so that kind of thinking kind of propagates, all right, how do you then use that thinking, that, that obsession almost, to then make money, right? So, so I would always hack ways um, to, to make money. So it seems like I see two different beliefs there that come together that help you become a successful entrepreneur. One is the belief that anything in the world I see, I can make more efficient. And the other one is the belief that, that I can sell that and make some money. Would that be correct? Yeah, so the, the part is correct. But I think the, the, the part that where my mom was very encouraging, because a lot of my friends at school in Malaysia, uh, you know, parents are more conservative, right? So, so my friends' parents would be like, don't, do, do, don't work or don't work part-time, don't sell something, you should be studying in school. So my friends' parents would always emphasize grades. But the funny thing is my parents never really emphasized grades for me. Um, so they would let me just run amok and do whatever I want to do. <laughs> and what else did you do besides Badu Saramban? Oh, I sold lots of things. I mean, I did door-to-door -door sales. How old were you? I was like, I was form two, so I was probably... Eight years old? No, form two is like 14, oh, 14 years old. Right. Yeah, but it's still under age to actually technically sell, right? So my, my mom used to own a catalog business and she was going to shut it down and she had a lot of extra inventory. She's like, girl, she called me girl. <laughs> what do you want to do with this extra stock? Like, what do you think you can do about it? So I'm like, why don't I just take it and, and sell it door to door to enterprises? So she's like, okay, I will drive you to, to the buildings and, and why don't you figure out how to sell it? So I went back to school, I was in Form 2. I, ha I recruited a Form 1 guy, my junior. Uh, we were both prefects at the time. I'm like, I will pay you 200 bucks for this whole thing and you would just help me carry the stuff because they were heavy stuff, they were filing systems, they were talking alarm clocks, car ionizers, all kinds of like really crappy stuff like that. And so I just went and I was clearly under age. Um, and, and we went to like, my mom drove me to the Golmak building in uh, as a spy, Klan And uh, you know, they always have this uh, no solic solicitation poster up there. And, and then when my friend and I came, uh, the guard stopped us and he was like, oh, sorry, uh, what are you here for? And I kind of told a little lie. I'm like, I'm delivering stuff to my client. So he let me up, right? And when I went up, I, I just went floor to floor to floor and knocked on people's doors and like, hi, I'm selling filing cabinets uh, to help you organize your files better. And, and I sold 
everything that day. So then would it be correct to say that if you want your kid to be a successful entrepreneur, you need to tell them to forget about their grades, <laughs> use them as child labor, <laughs> teach them to disregard signs that say no solicitation, lie to security guards, <laughs> um, sell Batu Surumban that gets confiscated by the teachers, but that could lead to your kid someday running magic. Maybe. Or be an but, 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 but that's interesting, right? Because if you look at what Cheryl is saying, her parents were different from most parents in I Malaysia. My parents say, didn't say ignore my grades, though. They still said, okay, good, get good grades, but also, you know, you're okay to go out and work. But what I also found interesting is that you said your teacher, I mean, to me, and, and of course I'm different, right? If I was a teacher and I saw a kid had figured out ways to make money out of other kids, <laughs> I'm going, damn, you good. Yeah. But it seems that your teacher confiscated this stuff and yeah, said you shouldn't did. do that. Yeah, she said she would bring me to detention if I didn't stop selling stuff. Because they wanted me to get good grades, right? It's, it is mm -hmm. the Asian way of thinking. So people can interpret that in different ways, right? As a child, what did you interpret? Well, I, I, okay, my mom, so this is where I maybe got my first inkling for why, you know, for, for you know, this childhood dream of wanting to be an entrepreneur. At the time, I didn't know the word entrepreneur it was a businesswoman, right? Because my mom mm -hmm. was a businesswoman. And she always told me, like, girl, again, she called me girl, <laughs> like, don't, uh, don't ever be someone who depends on your husband. Don't get married and, like, be a housewife. Always be independent and always make your own money so that you can do whatever you want and you can buy whatever you want. And so from a very young age, she taught me that principle. And, and it comes with it, right? So when I'm, I'm enterprising and I'm finding ways to, to optimize stuff, she would really encourage it. Plus, I didn't come from a very rich family, so we were quite, um, you know, quite like middle class. And then when the financial crisis hit, we actually got really poor to the point where my parents didn't even save up for my college. And uh, we, just, we just had no money. And all my friends who, whose parents didn't let them go out and work, um, their parents did save up money for them, right? Because they're the parents who wanted them, them to do well in school. They went to Taylor's College, Sunway College, US, UK, and I was the one who was like, oh shoot, I have to stay back and, and do a local uni. Um, but, but that's why... So did you do a local uni? No, I didn't. I, so I, I studied really hard, I excelled in school, and I think it's just this, this drive in me to always do the best that I can. Um, to, to accomplish it. So I ended up getting a scholarship, a government scholarship actually, to study in the US, and that's how I ended up at Cornell University in Wow, in New York. So, you went, so you went from um, getting in trouble to getting into an Ivy League university on a government scholarship. Yeah, so um, I think part of it is, besides being driven and entrepreneurial, I always have this feeling that I want to prove people wrong. So people, when, when you meet someone, you have perceptions about them, right? You're like, you know, people make judgments about you in like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And so I think there was, um, and, and I actually don't like this way of thinking where people judge a book by its cover and, and automatically they already form thoughts about you. So for me, I never think that way. When I meet someone, I always give them second chances. I, I always have, I always give them the benefit of doubt. So when people judge me, I feel really hurt because I'm like, how do you know? You don't really know me. Like how, how, how much do you know about me, right? So. I, I tend to grow up uh, challenging conventions about who I am and who I want to be. So for example, I think it was in high school, a group of girlfriends and I got together um, and we had a, a sleepover. And uh, so we went about taking turns talking about our first impressions of, of each other. And everyone unanimously said, Cheryl, you are very girly and you are very feminine. And, and you know, when, when I heard that, I was a little offended actually. I was like, girly, feminine, what do you mean by that? Do you mean I'm weak? Do you mean I'm too nice? And so, so that made me actually pick up Taekwondo. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I became a second degree black belt and I spot competitively for eight years of my life. I, uh, I play squash, I play golf, I drink scotch, um, I, I snowboard, so I do a lot of guy things and I, I became an entrepreneur, right? So, so that, That's awesome. I'm a second degree black belt as well. I sparred for seven years of my life. We should spar after this <laughs> and <laughs> charge the audience 40 that. ringgit. Right, and the winner takes all the money. That'll be awesome. When was the last time you sparred? <laughs> Let's not answer that. But, but go on. Yeah, so, um, so I'm always challenging conventions about who I am. Um, so going back to like golf, right, for example, I. I hated golf. I, I just, the, the game, I didn't understand golf. Like, 
I'm sure you don't golf, right? No. Like, yeah, so, so people who don't golf hate golf because it's like wasting time. And you don't really get exercise out of it. You're just hitting a damn ball. And most people who golf are fat. And <laughs> Sorry, Does anybody guys. here golf? Sorry. Would you like I a mean, refund? I golf now. I, I, I'm golfing this weekend. So I hate it. I hate, um, I'm afraid of heights. Um, but I, sky, I went skydiving. Um, but I, wait, let, 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 let's stop there for a second. <gasps> because there are so many different events in your life that, that yeah. you've brought up. And what we are trying to do is try to understand beliefs, right? Yeah. Beliefs you had about the world. Because does anyone here have... Um, does anyone here have a daughter? Anyone else who's the parent of a, of a baby girl? OK, so, so I have a one-year-old daughter, right? Her name is Eve. And one of the things that fascinates me about interviewing women like Cheryl is, I wonder how as Eve grows up, she would perceive um, her, her gender roles, mm. OK? Um, and so I found it very interesting that you felt angry that you were called girl-like and feminine. Yeah. Why do you think you felt angry about that? It wasn't anything bad, to be honest. And till the, today, people have those impressions about me. And it's something I can't change, right? But I think it was what comes with that, with the connotation that comes behind that, right? Is that um, when, when you're being labeled as something, that's why I ask you, don't ask me questions where I have to tell you five words to describe myself. Right. I, I don't like labeling stuff because that confines you into a box. That, that, oh, I'm this or I'm that, but I cannot be, I cannot be something opposite. So I'm actually a Gemini, and I don't know if you guys know your horoscopes, but Geminis are twins, right? And we're known to be, to have like, I don't know, multiple personalities or double personalities where we're pretty adaptable. So, and I'm that kind of person. I can be, I can be this and I can be that. I can be the opposite. So that's kind of how I've lived my whole life. So for me, I don't want people to box me in, so I think that's, that's just it. Can I ask you an honest question? Sure. Do you think you became an entrepreneur and you had this drive because somewhere subconsciously you were trying to be less like a girl? Probably. I think, I think one of the, yeah, probably. But it's also, I don't think it's more like less a girl, it's a girl or guy thing. I don't think it's a gender thing. But it's more like, well, I can do it too. I, have, I always have this mindset that why not, right? I, I think I can do it. So there's no, like, there's no way, there's no like mental barriers. So that's that's fascinating. And, I, and, and because what Cheryl pulled off, starting a company in New York as an immigrant, right? So she's not an American. It was not her native country. You started a company, Reclip, Reclip.it, and you sold it to Walmart. Uh, and for how many million are you allowed to say that? No. <laughs> but it's a large amount, <laughs> it's right? It's okay, yeah. It's a, so we that's, did okay. that in, in every definition is the height of success for many people, right? And I bet you enjoyed what you did. So well, there were some ups and downs. <laughs> so to get there, I mean, to get to that level, if you think about why parents today spend all that money sending their kids to, to college, it's because we want those kids to have the tools, the knowledge, the education so they can get a good job retire, someday live a good life. Mm -hmm. um, and what you did was, in your 20s, mm -hmm. you already made a ton of money because you started the company, you became successful, you sold it. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't planned. It wasn't planned. But something about you, something led to that drive. Mm -hmm. and, I try, and I wonder, what is that? Because it's not just you. There are lots of other 20-year-olds I've met here in Malaysia and outside who've been able to shortcut that definition for success. Mm -hmm. If you could think about like three or four or five things that happened mm -hmm. before you were 25, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I would love to hear you share that because that might give us a clue on what beliefs and messages we need to put in our kids. Mm -hmm. I already noticed one. And that one I noticed was your parents and how your parents encouraged you to go out and sell stuff and make money. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really, really important belief. I want to make sure that my son growing up mm -hmm knows that he isn't just going to get handouts from me, mm -hmm. but that he has to figure out a way to go out and make money, even if it's just a couple of mm -hmm. ringgit but or it's selling yeah. rabbit poop. And, and it wasn't just about making money, right? In the process, I learned how to sell. Yes. And being an entrepreneur, you have to sell to everyone, your, your teammates, your investors, your future employees, everyone. So, so I think when I went door-to-door -door selling, um, I think that actually made me, uh, you know, gave me the, the courage to, to talk to strangers and to change my pitch as I, as I go along. If this pitch didn't work, then let me change my pitch. 
and then when, when I got a good response, then I know to stick to that, right? So from a very young age, I, I kind of learned that just through selling. And that's another lesson. So let's look at selling, for example, right? If you speak to many successful entrepreneurs, selling, the ability to sell to market is one of the primary skills. And, but if you think about it, there is no specific business degree for selling. I remember reading one book. I can't remember who the entrepreneur was, but he criticized Stanford University. He said, you go to Stanford and you see all these different courses as part of the MBA program, but there's not one single course at Stanford on how to sell. Because in many elite universities, Ivy League universities, they see selling as, as a slimy skill. But in reality, Almost every entrepreneur I've spoken yeah. to says it's one of the most significant skills they need to make their business successful. There are a lot of things that, a lot of skills that universities don't teach you, right? How, how to communicate well. That's a really important skill as so well. So I want to come to that in a moment. Mm. I want to, the next question I'm going to ask you after we try to, to see what some of the beliefs you took on is what skills do you think the people in this room have to pick up mm. or teach their kids so their kids could short circuit, shortcut their way to success as well? Okay, so the first thing we established is that as a child, your parents encourage you to step out and, and, and make money. The second thing we established is that you learn to sell. Selling is important. Mm. The third thing we established is that you were not given handouts. Mm. You had to find a way to pay for your own university or study hard and get a scholarship. Mm -hmm. Okay, would you say that those are three contributing pieces? I think among others, yeah. I mean, part of that is being resourceful, right? So it's, you've been given this much, how do you expand the pie? And that, that's part of what I learned, um, to be in control of your life as well. Because I think a lot of people, when you're given a situation, like say in your family, and I, to be honest, I didn't have a perfect family. In fact, my family is, I had quite, my dad was not a good dad, unfortunately. So I didn't have a good father figure. Um, but and and he didn't save up for my education and all that and then just before i left for the u.s uh, my parents got a divorce and i saw how that affected my my brother and my sister and so you know i think and i've seen how it affected a lot of my friends in the u.s too who come from maybe broken homes and broken families um but they get so stuck in that right they get so stuck with the, the bitterness that came with it like oh it's because of my family situation that i'm i'm here now and you get stuck in the rut and you keep blaming and blaming and or you don't talk about it and you keep it pent up but it appears in all aspects of your life it emanates right in, in very different ways in your relationships in your your relationships with your your boyfriend girlfriend your bosses your friends um so so the way i dealt with it was that um i realized that how i grew up should not define who i am in the future and I think I was quite depressed until like college. I think within college, because I was in the US and it was far from home and I was starting to feel like a little stressed out and why am I here? You know, like you question life. Um, and it was a, a, some point where I started sharing, I started to talking, talking about it. So it's kind of like that, that just threw it out there. So when you, when you talk about it, when, you, when you're not shy to talk about your past, no matter how bad it is, um, you accept it. It means that you're accepting it, right? Right, I can see that in, in how you're talking about it right now. Yeah, yeah. And so when, when you do that, then you're no, no longer controlled by your past. And then you let go of your past and you let your new, what do you want in your life define who, who you want to be? So when I got past that point, because I, I got through this really tough period in my freshman year, because I was on a scholarship and I was under pressure to get good grades and I was in a foreign country, um, and my parents had just divorced a year before I left, right? So... Was that when you started your business, when you were freshman year in university? No. Um, well, I started a few businesses as a, as a kid, right? And uh, no, but I, I was just very active in, in university. I, I started a, a club, you know, I, I brought... Um, it's a whole new story. I, I brought uh, a labyrinth to campus. Um, I raised a lot of money for it. Um, I was pretty much like the president here, secretary here, treasurer there. I just wanted to immerse myself in, in the American culture because I'm like, if I'm here, I'm given this one shot to study abroad. What is it about life I can learn from, right. from the Americans, right? That I cannot 
learn here. If I'm just, if I were just to sit in my room and study and get good grades, I could do that in a local university here. I don't need to be abroad to do that. So, so then I really thought after that first year when I didn't feel very good, um, to find what is my purpose here in the US? What do I want to learn from these successful people? And what makes America, America, right? One of the, the most powerful countries in, in the world. And what, what did you find? So, um, so I think I found myself. I think in, a, in the US it's very open and very transparent, right? And that whole culture taught me to be open about it, to, to talk about it, and not just bury things under the carpet. Because the more you do that, like I said, the more pent up it is. Um, so by doing that, I think my, my life just flipped for the better, right? Um, of course, I went through a lot of ups and downs throughout other journeys. Um, but I think that was when I could really achieve my full potential. Now, how many years after university did you start Reclip? So I didn't start it af right after uni. Um, I had three jobs because as a Malaysian, you. You don't, if you don't have a visa, right. you can't just start a company. So I had to do my H-1B visa, and then I got my green card. I was very lucky. It was a very long, arduous process. And then I was able to, to jump ship. And it was always like, you know, because I was, I was always a management consultant or a finance analyst. And when I went to these networking events and I met women who, when they gave me their business cards, they're like, oh, I'm a, an owner of this business. And I felt like, I should be saying that, you know, what, I've always been an entrepreneur in my life, why am I not saying that? Why am I not saying that? So then I knew that I had to do something about it. Right? So I, I, I noticed two other things that you did. So see, what I'm trying to do is notice things that Cheryl does, does or did in her life before she became successful that most people do not do because it's from these things that we can learn from. If every entrepreneur who sat down here said, um, I studied hard, I went to college, I listened to my parents, then you wouldn't really learn anything. There would be a part to mediocrity, right? But I noticed two additional things that you did that were unusual. Number one, it's interesting that when you went to the US, you decided that you wanted to immerse yourself in American culture and really try to understand what, in your words, what made America a great country. I wanna ask you about that, and that's why I think, and here's why I think this is important. I too went to school in the US, the University of Michigan. There were 110 Malaysian students in that university. All of them hung out together by themselves all the time. Mm. They would invite me to hang out with them and I'm like, guys, I love you, but I want to meet people who were born from a different country. Mm. So all my friends were people that were from different countries. I didn't hang out with the Malaysians. Mm. And I remember after graduating from university, moving to Silicon Valley, I remember two Malaysians from the East Coast got a job in Silicon Valley. And they were introduced to me because I'd been there for a while. I wanted to make sure that they were comfortable. I took them to a party. And they just stuck by themselves in a corner smoking. And of course, in America, in California, when you smoke, you are an outcast. <laughs> Nobody likes smokers. In California. <laughs> in, in California. And sure enough, within a couple of months, they were laid off from the company because they mm. couldn't adapt to the culture. Mm. I noticed this as a consistent problem among Malaysian students. Malaysian students tend to hang out with yeah. other students, the, the with, with other Malaysian students. But yeah. I noticed that not just among Malaysians, but with people of all different ethnicities, they clump together. Because that's what's comfortable. Right. But you forced yourself to do something different. I'm trying to understand yeah. why, what drove that, and how did you make yourself comfortable? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that first year, of course, um, when it's a strange land in the first year, I did hang out with a lot of Malaysians. Um, but it was that period after first year, I told you, I went through this, a little bit of a depres depression, for, and, and kind of trying to find myself. And the, the whole, the, the same reason, like, if I, were to just hang out with Malaysians, then wh why can't I just do it here? I'm, I've been very lucky, one of the lucky few ones to get selected by JPA to go on this scholarship, and the scholarship was probably worth around a quarter million dollars. Wow. Yeah, the whole thing is freaking expensive to go to Cornell. So why am I here, right? So then I, there was a mind shift. I also went to this um, leadership camp. Um, I don't know if you know, do you know Chin Chow? No, but I did go for leadership as well. See, we have a lot, of, a lot of leadership. Yes, oh, we have cool. a lot in common. Wow, I didn't know that. So Chen Chao is this guy who was my one year senior, and he's the COO of Groupon. And uh, he was the reason why I went to Cornell, actually, because I didn't know any universities in, in the US. And Cornell was my first choice because of Chen Chao. Um, so when I was kind of depressed, Chen Chao was like, I, I just attended this leadership course, and I think you should attend. And the leadership is like a three-day, five-day camp. Yeah 
where they put 50 engineering students with 50 human ecology students or psychology majors together because they, they wanted us to really embrace each other because one is technical, one is very mm -hmm. non-technical, right? And uh, that whole course just like changed my trajectory. Um, and that was the impetus to me asking a lot of these questions about my life, my, my childhood, my background. Um, so after that camp, I literally made a vow. I have these moments where I'm like, I'm going to do this, and I just set out and do it, and I'm very like stuck on it. So, so that summer, I decided that I will try not to hang out with Malaysians. It doesn't mean I will be snobbish and ignore them, but I will make an effort to get to know the community, not just um, the white people, <laughs> the Americans, but also there's so many people there, like from Bulgaria, from Russia, from India, from all parts of the world. And I was living in the International House of Living, which meant every, everyone from, from the rest of the world. Um, and then my junior year, I hung out with a lot of Americans because I was trying to understand the fraternity culture. <laughs> so I went to a lot of frat parties and, and things like that that I should not further discuss here. <laughs> yeah, but, but it was very interesting because it opened my mind. I think... So what, what do you think would be different about Malaysian culture mm -hmm. versus American culture? Like, what can Malaysians, yeah. let's say Malaysians who are in their early 20s, yeah. learn from Americans of that same age? Now, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, yeah, yeah. but you having experienced both, yeah. um, I'd love to know what you think Malaysians can learn from yeah. American culture. I, in fact, I actually don't think it's just Americans. I think that when you're too cocoony, you're too comfortable in your own environment, your mind doesn't expand because you're not exposed to different ways of thinking and different ways of seeing things. So if you're not as fortunate to go abroad to study, travel. Traveling can really help you expand your horizons, right? And then don't just hit spots. You go there and really understand the culture and why people do certain things. You mix with the, the locals and that's where you can get the true cultural immersion. That makes you a better person. That makes you a better entrepreneur, a better lover, a better daughter. Um, I think it really makes a difference. But what's unique about America, I, so I, I had a choice to go to the UK or to, to America. And a lot of people in Malaysia choose to go to UK because we're, we're taught the British English, right? Um, but I, I actively chose to go to the US because um, I think the American culture, they, I feel like they embrace um, for example, education in, in school, mm -hmm. right? The British way is you go, you deep dive, you you become an expert in one field, and you study just that. And and I'm the kind of person who I'm like I rather be a jack of all trades, um, master of hopefully one or two, <laughs> but I like variety. And I think that's that's also another principle of of my or my life principle is to try different things. I'm not the kind of person who you go to the same restaurant over and over again. I'm the kind who would. I want to try different things because if you don't try, you never know how you feel about that new food or that new restaurant, right? So I feel like the American system embodies that. They don't just, like when I went to school in engineering, you, ha you had to take humanities. I, take, I took relationship psychology. I took wine tasting. I took um, landscape. Wine tasting, yeah. seriously? <laughs> it's you, the most skilled course at Cornell. You took that for the education or? <laughs> Both, yeah. <laughs> And I actually even taught it the next semester. It's because all the TAs get to bring, bring home the leftover wines. So wow. I got paid to bring home wine. Incredible. But, but that's very true about the American education system. Yeah. I studied uh, drama and theater. Mm -hmm. I studied photography. I remember my first year engineering school in University of Michigan. I started signing up for all these theater classes. And my parents were really, really, really freaking out. They were like, what is going on? Uh, but look at me. I'm now on stage. <laughs> it, it paid off. <laughs> So, so before, before we deep dive on that, okay, um, what is it? Because you are charged with a really big goal to help raise entrepreneurs in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important. Uh, that's why it's so interesting to understand how, how, you, how you see the world. What do you think in Malaysia can be done to create more entrepreneurs? What could we do in our schooling system or our education or our values or our culture or our beliefs as a society? Hmm. Changing the education system, I don't know. That would take a miracle. <laughs> I, I don't know. What do you guys think? <laughs> but what, what specifically would you change? 
I mean, and it doesn't have to be the education system. Yeah. It, could be, it could be a belief system. It could be values that Malaysian parents send to their kids. What, what do you think are some of the key ingredients that we might want to adjust to create more entrepreneurs? To create more entrepreneurs, I, I guess, um, I mean, it's the same stuff, right? Like, like failure, accept failure and, and understand that, or how do you educate people that failure that's, is a good thing? That's a big one. So I was talking to a guy called Salim, who is a um, head of Singularity University in Silicon Valley. And Salim was brought to speak to the Malaysian prime minister to advise him on how to raise entrepreneurs. And I asked Salim, what did you tell um, our prime minister? And Salim said, I told him that what Malaysia should do is create a competition. And in that competition, that award ceremony, they want to pick up, they want to call up the, the three Malaysian entrepreneurs, nominees, who had spectacular failures, have them share their failures, mm -hmm. then give an award to the person who failed the biggest. Mm -hmm. Because what he said is the problem with Malaysia, unlike Silicon Valley, is that in Silicon Valley, when you're talking about, when you're talking about your life as an entrepreneur, as a failure, you will say something along the lines of, so I started this company, then it bombed, then I lost everything, then I was sleeping on a friend's couch for a while, <laughs> and then you'll ask them, so what are you doing now? They go, oh, I'm starting my next company. Mm. But in Malaysia, it's a, it's a, it's a taboo. It's to, yeah. to talk about failure is a taboo. It it's is. like you failed. <laughs> you have disappointed your parents and your culture. <laughs> so so that's, that's a really, really, really big one. It is, it is like that. So at Magic, we're hiring. I know I'm not supposed to talk about it, but I'm no, no, hiring. No, you can talk about Magic. I'm hiring field entrepreneurs. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. No, because I think that, that is awesome that you've tried Please, it. Please continue the applause. And, and I'm... <laughs> I fail, right? And and I want, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to talk about magic, but but I want entrepreneurs to lead an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Otherwise, how can you build entrepreneurs if you you don't understand what it's like to to be right. an entrepreneur, to fail, and to, or to succeed, or to raise money? So, do you want to start that awards ceremony? <laughs> I know an amazing space. <laughs> sure, we can do it here. Awesome. <laughs> but okay, so the little the, another side story to this is that. Um, in November last year, we brought 50 plus entrepreneurs, Malaysian entrepreneurs to Stanford, to Silicon Valley for two weeks. So in one of the sessions, the professor said, the Silicon Valley professor, the Stanford professor said, um, do, you, do you guys know that more than half of you in this room will fail? And then all the Malaysians went, oh, you know, they were all like, shh, like, like choy, like pantang, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that, right? Uh, and it was so funny because, um, they took it so seriously. And they were like, why would you say such a thing? Kind of, you know? And then, and then I kind of got up and say, hey guys, you know, actually, if half of you guys fail, the other half will succeed, should hire and push the guys who fail. <laughs> and then they started looking around and like, hmm. And they started looking at each other in a different light, where now, oh, I have a reason to network with, with each other and get to know you. Because then, then a, sudden, a, a light bulb suddenly appeared and then they, they saw it in a different way, right? And I, I was trying to tell them that this is exactly what happens in Silicon Valley. There's so many startups and entrepreneurs. Of course, a lot of them will fail because um, there's more supply than there is demand, right, for products and services. So what happens in, in Silicon Valley is then the weaker startups then get absorbed in, in the stronger startups. But that's okay because that makes the successful companies get stronger. And it's not a failure, but you are now part of a better vehicle. And so when, when those entrepreneurs got it, it was almost like, a, like an epiphany. And then they, you know, they look at failure as, as a different thing now. So that's beautiful, Cheryl. And, I love you. and that's a very important lesson. Let's recap, OK, for the audience, like lessons that we have covered so far. And jump in if you feel I missed on, on any of the points. So one is encourage your kids and teach them that earning money is good that they can go out there, sell something even if it's small, and earn a few dollars. Let them get the taste for that. Number two, teach your children, teach yourself sales. It's one of the key, most important skills as an entrepreneur. But we've created a society where sales training isn't a degree. You cannot become, get a master in sales, but I bet if you did, you'd pay off your college debts really quickly. Uh -huh. Can I tell a joke on that? Yes, please. Sorry. We love jokes. So, so my dad, uh, even though he wasn't the greatest dad, he told me this joke, uh, the, the three C's of selling. So first, you try to convince. If you don't manage to convince, you confuse. And if that fails, you con. <laughs> <laughs> that's what salespeople do. Right, and, and, and that's how you got past the security guards. Yes, that's what he taught me, I guess. 
that's 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 <laughs> awesome. And um, the third lesson, the third lesson is get out of your comfort zone. One of the problems here in Malaysia, if you if you look at Malaysian schools, Chinese, Indians, Malays, all go to different schools. That's ridiculous. And I w and even within our own culture, Malaysians aren't diverse and aren't mixing around as much as they should be. So the third lesson is try to get out of your own comfort zone. Get out, experience different cultures. Um, in Mind Valley, we have 40 different nationalities working from this office and the office below, 40. And one of the reasons I do that is I specifically, if I see someone apply from a country we have never hired before, I want that person because diversity is such a key yeah. value. Okay, right. so that's number four. Now, the fifth one, the fifth one was accept failure. Understand that failure is simply part of a process. It is nothing to be ashamed of. It is probably one of the biggest learning tools you can have. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there was a fifth thing. You didn't mention it, but we can see it in Cheryl's story. And that fifth thing is, if, if, if I can paraphrase, y you do not have to be a victim of your circumstance. Because if you look at what Cheryl did, I learned a couple of things completely new about you that I would never have guessed. Most of my Malaysian friends who are successful entrepreneurs came from wealthy families. Mm -hmm. Most of them never had to study hard and get good grades. Their parents paid for their university, me included. You came from a broken home. Mm -hmm. You um, didn't have money growing up. You got a scholarship from the government. And unlike most Malaysians who went to study abroad in the government scholarship, you stepped out of the Malaysian circle, did incredible things in your university, made a whole new network of friends, and then ended up redefining your entire world. I think you deserve a round of applause for that. Thank you. So let's go on to what happened after university, okay? But before that, there was an interesting thing. You, you wrote an interesting blog post that many people have asked you about. I want to now learn about some of your systems. How is it that Cheryl runs her day-to-day -day life, right? So now we want to understand. We've tried to understand your beliefs about the world. Now we want to try to understand what makes you you. What are the practices that you put in from the time you wake up in the morning to how you get your job done that make you effective? Because you have a massive task that you're doing right now. So first, let me ask you the question on the blog post. What are your guiding principles in life? Mm, OK, so did you read that? <laughs> No, but I heard I should have. <laughs> yeah, um, that was a long time ago. So, I, oh, actually, no, this was a couple of years ago. It was when my grandma died on my birthday. Um, I turned, I think I turned, I turned 30. And when, in San Francisco, I think at midnight, my mom called me. And she, after a few seconds, uh, minutes, she's like, I heard someone choking. And then my mom's like, hold on, let me call you back. And it was my mom, my grandma. She, she was choking to death, unfortunately. So, so I stayed on the iPad, and she called me back. And I was very sad to hear that my, my grandma, who brought me up, taught me Cantonese. And uh, she was my closest grandma. She had passed away on my 30th birthday. And uh, my mom kept the iPad on. And so I heard my aunts, my uncles all came. And they cried. And they ended up laughing. It was until 4 AM, I was listening to them. You know, technology is great. You know, right. you feel like you're there, but you're not really there. Right? I was just quiet the whole time. But um, through that, I was kind of like, you know, I wanted to write to, to kind of flush out what I felt. And I was like, there, why did she, at first I felt angry. Why did she die on my birthday? Why, why remind me that she's no, no longer here on my birthday? And then it made me think about the circle of life and death. You know, it's, it's maybe she's trying to remind me of her good life. She, has ten, she had 10 kids. She has 10 kids, so um, she's definitely lived a, a really awesome life. Um, and then when you think about death, it, it's kind of humbling, right? Oh, what have you achieved in life? So that was when I came up with this blog post. And I was thinking, what are my guiding principles in life? Um, so this has guided me in the past two years, uh, most of the decisions I've made. So I think of two things two points in my life. One is my wedding day. I'm not married yet. <laughs> and my deathbed. Um, so the reason why I th think of these two incidents is, one, on your wedding day. Um, in, I guess in the more Western culture, you have your bridesmaids, right? Your closest friends. And then you maybe invite 100 people. I know here you invite like 1,000 people. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. So who are going to be my bridesmaids? Um, have I made enough 
meaningful close friendships that I know who are those five bridesmaids that I'm going to invite and who are the hundred people that I absolutely have to have for my wedding. If I cannot identify those people, then I have not been a good friend. I've not been a good, a good mm. I've not built enough good relationships. So that's one. So that really set me on like, who do I really want to spend time with? Who do I really want to cultivate a good, relation, meaningful relationship with? Then the second thing is my deathbed. Um, you know, life is so ephemeral. You could, you could die in a, you know, an accident tomorrow. You could live until you're 80 or 90. You never know, right? So if, if I were to die tomorrow, will people be crying? Will people be um, indifferent? They probably won't even know I died and I'm gone. Uh, what would they say about me? What's my eulogy, right? It's kind of like, what, what do I want people to say about me? Have I, been, have I done something in this world that made a difference? Even if it impacted one person and that person came up to, to the stand and said, Cheryl has done so and so for me, then I would have impacted someone's life or if I created a product that changed people's lives like Mind Valley is doing right with your personal growth products um, so then that guides me in my more of my career then what what do I want to do in my career that can impact lives and change people's lives so so th those are my two that's actually a really 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 beautiful system and, and actually that, that that's a perfect example because when you talk about system we talk about little things that we often do to motivate us or inspire us or help us define life and I think what you have is actually a really a beautiful system I'm gonna I'm already married but let's say if I had a massive birthday party and I had to invite a hundred people I think that's a beautiful system I need to start thinking about and um, I love the one about the deathbed as well it's a really amazing system tell us do you have any other um, defined systems that you use to motivate you or inspire you or help you reach towards your goals it is about challenging conventions and not being set in your mind about something. So always thinking that there's always two sides to the story, right? That what, like I'm always, I'm never stuck to what I think. Very rarely am, am I, I am super stubborn about a few principles and beliefs that are just immutable to me. But for the most part, everything else, you can convince me to change, right? So for example, I, I hated golf, I hated I was afraid of heights. I hated rock climbing and now I'm an avid rock climber. I once swore I would never come back to Malaysia and I would never work for the government. And I'm here doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and, and the thought process that I had when I decided to come back, because I was very comfortable, right? Think, talking about getting mm -hmm. out of your comfort zone is that, um, you know, one, of course, I felt that I could impact more people here and, and I, got, I wouldn't be where I am today without a scholarship. So I have to come back and give, give back. True. And, and, or if the government took a risk on someone like me, which is very unconventional for them to hire someone, young girl, you know, someone like me, then I should take a risk on them. I mean, they promised me certain things and maybe it's a lie, I don't know. But if, if I don't try, I would never know how true that is, right? So for me, I'm just like, yeah, that's kind of, tricky should I live my life to come back and but I did right and so and, and I'm here <laughs> and you've done amazingly well I mean Cheryl is the only person I know who's been quoted by President Obama <laughs> yeah he he called my name but I think he probably forgets who I am now <laughs> so so that that's interesting right you said you said that you have a belief that you, you want to change your mind a lot and um, in our society, so there's a fear of failure, but there's also a, an idea that people who change their mind are flip-floppers. Yet, people like Jeff Bezos, who founded Amazon, said the smartest people he knows in the world are people who change their mind all the time because they're not tied to any one idea or belief about the world. With new evidence, they're willing to shift it. And he says this adaptability is what makes them successful. Now, I'm curious, I'd love to ask you this. Given how often you you renew your beliefs or change your mind. What are some beliefs you had in the past that you decided to discard as you move forward in life? Um, hmm. It ties back to this actually, that I, you know, making decisions, I, I, I find it, I'm still pretty bad at it, but I'm getting better. Like I'm indecisive, right? And um, I'm afraid to make the decision that I'm, I'll make the wrong decision. 
Um, because I think we all have this belief that, oh shoot, like if I do this and I'm trapped or I, I've invested too much in this. And then I think what, what made me change is to view decisions as experiments. So, and, and so this comes, to, comes back to you know, how I challenge conventions and try different things. So it's not so much like I'm flip-flopping, but I'm just trying to try something new. If I like it, stay. If I don't like it, change, right? And so everyone has their unhappy, happy moments, right? Or, or jobs that you hate and you're unhappy, but you, you are in it. Or relationships that where you're unhappy, you're still in it. Abusive relationships where you're still in it, right? Because people are afraid of change. But if you view that as just an experiment, and, I, and you, you just keep changing jobs until you find the one that you love, then eventually you'll get there. So it's not about just flip-flopping. It's about daring to move if you're not happy until you're happy, right? Until you find something that is midpoint where so, so let's talk about skills. let's talk about you, right? So after university, what different jobs did you go through before you started Reclip? And what was that phase or that aha moment that made you do that? Um, I was a management consultant because you know I had the visa thing. Mm -hmm. if, if I had a choice, actually my original dream was to come back here because I thought having a government scholarship, I had to serve a, a seven year bond, <laughs> which I actually, eventually I came back and, uh, but they didn't have a job for me. So then I, I went back to the US and I got a job there, right? Um, so, where was I? <laughs> so you served as a management consultant for yeah, what, yeah, for what so, company? Um, well, I was a, in an engineering company, like I a see. water, yeah. wastewater engineering firm, because I, it's not easy to get a visa right. in the US, so I was a, an engineer, I had to get a job in engineering, which I didn't like at, at the time. I wanted to be a management consultant, right? So I got another scholarship to go back to Cornell to do my, um, my master's in engineering management. So in the US, it's really funny. If you have that word management in there and you're trying to get a management consulting job, you can. Otherwise, it's just really hard, right? So then I ended up being a management consultant, and I thought that was the dream job that I wanted. But it wasn't. <laughs> it was. It actually sucked because that was when the financial crisis happened, and um, most of our clients were like Amex and a lot of the, the big credit firms. Um, so it was the most unglamorous time to be a consultant, where all my projects were cost-cutting, firing, outsourcing, and all that. So I was quite jaded with that. And I had a really good friend and mentor who's now a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. It's a, a famous BC firm in the Valley. So. She, I told him, like, you know, I, you seem really passionate about what you do all the time. Um, I hate my job, and, and I feel like I'm stuck with it. What, what should I do? So he's like, well, Cheryl, think about what you're passionate about. What are your three biggest passion? And then he forced me to say it. So I was like, at the time I was in New York City, you know, I was like, food, I'm a foodie. I like to travel, and I like fashion. So it seems superficial, right? But, you know, that's kind of, like, well, that's what I can think. So she, he's like, Cheryl, then think about ways to, to get closer to that, right? You don't have to jump jobs right away, but think about ways to get closer to that. So I started thinking, well, I can't really travel all the time. I can't start a travel agency. Um, but food, there are a lot of food critics in, in New York, um, food bloggers, f food newsletters, and all that. So I actually ended up... Um, getting in and I was a food critic, a restaurant critic, where I was paid every week to, to dine and I actually ended up dining at two-thirds of the Michelin star restaurants wow. in New York. And, and I wanted to work for um, a food newsletter um, and I was working toward that industry to eventually open a restaurant because <laughs> I thought, okay, that's what I want to do, a restaurant, or be a restauranter. Because I didn't understand the, the concept of startups at the time. There wasn't really such a thing, or tech entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thought, okay, yeah, let's, let's be. But, but then when I went into the industry, and I realized, and I almost signed up for a French Culinary Institute to learn how to be a cook, I realized how grueling it was. I realized that, you know, I don't want to be in a food industry. Half of restaurants fail, right? It's such a risky business, high capital. Um, and so then, but I tried, at least I worked toward that path and I realized it's not for me, right? And then the next industry I went into, then this, this is my first exposure to tech. Uh, it was in fashion, right? So I did, I did food and then I did, um, so I thought, okay, let's try fashion out, right? 
Um, so my first startup idea, my silly startup idea, was actually a virtual wardrobe closet. Because in New York, you had tiny little closets, and women have to be so fashionable, so they always shop. But I'm like, where do you, right. how do you recycle your clothes? And I interviewed all my girlfriends, and they're like, I donate it, or I throw it away, or I give it away. I'm like, that's so wasteful. What if I could scan every piece of clothing in your cabinet, and the clothes that you don't want anymore, you list it in a platform, and people can buy or rent your, your, your dress, right? So I went through like a whole two months on a side project trying to figure if I can do that. But it ended up being too complicated. And that's when I came to the next idea where it was City Pockets, where I was trying to help people um, figure out a way to organize all the vouchers they're buying from Groupon, Living Social, and whatnot. And, and, um, and that was the idea that caught on. And I convinced my co-founder to join me. And we got accepted into an accelerator program that offered us funding. And, and we quit our jobs to do it. So it was, it was a few iterations to get there. And, and City Pockets became Reclip It? City Pockets became Reclip It. Um, we had to shut City Pockets down when Groupon IPO'd because right. the whole industry crashed. They went from being the darling of startups to like the nightmare. And no VCs will come 10 foot close to you if you are remotely associated with that industry at a time, right? And so having seen that, I'm like, there's no way we can uh, raise another round or continue working on this product. So that was one of my most painful experiences being an entrepreneur, is this baby, this first product that you started out with and you raised a million bucks with and you had to shut it down, right? Um, but, but then again, it comes back to that thinking where it's okay, it, it was an experiment, it didn't work. Let's try a new experiment with the, the money left over because we raised almost a million bucks. We had half the money left in the bank. so. It was a decision at a point, do we give back the other half to the investors and be like, oops, failed, let's try a new venture? Or do we take the other half of the money and convince our investors that let That's us another take another shot? And, and how many years did it take before this second company, Reclip It, you were able to uh, sell it to Walmart? A year and a half. That's incredibly a, fast, 18 so, months. Yeah, it was about a year and a half, two years really, with the first product. And about a year and a half, more than a year and a half, almost two years with the second product. So let's go back to, to you. Now, if you were that VC, or if someone came to you with a business idea, what would you look for to know if you want to invest in th that person and that idea? You know, uh, Paul Graham of Y Combinator wrote a lot about this, what he looks for in a startup founder, and I, I cannot um, agree more, it is resourcefulness. It is one word, if I can only use one word, it's resourcefulness, right? Um, he also wrote, a, I think, a little bit of naughtiness. A little mm -hmm. bit of, you cannot be the kind of person who is follow, following the book, right? That's why I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a rebel. I'm a nonconformist, which is why magic structure doesn't quite What's work What's the naughtiest me. thing you do? Oh, many. I don't know if I can say <laughs> I just here. wanted to be able to ask you that question on stage. <laughs> Maybe next time. Okay. So, <laughs> now... If money wasn't the problem, let's go back, let's go back to funding it and, and money. So you said the people think you'd look for a resourcefulness and naughtiness, right? But now, let's say you had unlimited money. What problem would you want to fix for the world? Um, this sounds like a beauty pageant question, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a tough one. If, I, if money wasn't an issue. Yes. Um, well... I was very into wearables. I was very into actually uh, quantify itself. So tracking data about yourself, because I truly believe that if you have data about yourself, it changes behaviors, it changes habits, right? So I want to probably build something. Actually, before I came back to Malaysia, I was on track to, mm -hmm. to start another company in that space. Um, in, in the wearable space. Because I think what's missing right now in the industry is you have all these trackers that give you a lot of data about yourself, but it doesn't tell you so what, right? So one of the experiments I did was I had this sleep tracker called uh, Sleep Cycle. I don't know, have you guys heard of it? It's an app. Yeah, I sleep have that. Yeah, you turn mm -hmm. it on and it tracks your sleep. If, if the, the movement, then you know you, you wake. Um, but a lot of people didn't know this feature in that app, where it's a note uh, feature. So you can... Um, so I use it as a, an alarm. What the app does is it wakes you up within a 30-minute um, cycle because it's, it's your REM cycle. So it knows when you're in light sleep 
and when it wakes you up with the alarm clock, you're not groggy, you're not in deep REM sleep, right? So I love it for that feature itself, it's, it's amazing. But uh, because I set my alarm every night, because I want to get seven hours of sleep every night, um, I can set like, I can set metrics where, oh, did you do yoga? Did you, did you um, drink coffee? Were you stressed out? Um, I don't know, did you have sex? <laughs> you know, all kinds of, you can set your own questions, right? Uh -huh. And then based on that, you get a correlation of uh, right. your sleep habits with those. I don't know if you guys did it. I did that. I, did I, I, I actually track all yeah. of that. It, it helps me figure out what makes me sleep well. Exactly. So then I, it was amazing because the, there was a huge negative correlation with my eating habits. If I ate after 8 o'clock and I ate a lot that day, so I had two things. One is if I just eat a lot throughout the day or if I ate after 8 o'clock, my the, the, there was the highest negative correlation. So I know I'm pretty sensitive to food. For sleeping. Mm, that's interesting. And by the way, people, that, that's what we mean by systems, right? What Cheryl just shared is a system she used to optimize her sleep. Sleep Tracker, try it. I've done the same thing. It's a really, really useful tool. Yeah, um, but, but the, the trackers now don't give you that data, right? It just tells you, oh, you've had a bad night. Then, okay, so what, what do I do about it, right? So when I set up these metrics, then I knew that if I exercise, my sleep trip improves tremendously. So everybody knows that exercising helps your sleep. This is a no-brainer. But the power of linking it with your own data is, is tenfold, right? Because I think humans, you know a lot of information. You know eating burgers are bad for you. KFC right. is bad for you. But in that moment when you're hungry and you're in front of the KFC, you just, you're weak. Humans are weak. You just eat it, right? But when I was speaking at this... Um, conference, a wearables conference, uh, the first wearables conference in, in SF, I was wearing my Google Glass. I was one of the first uh, thousand people to get the, the glass. And uh, I thought, I don't think it's there yet because it's too obvious and, and too hideous, right? But, but imagine a world in the future where as you're walking through a KFC and you feel weak, you want to eat it, and then this, this thing flashes to you that if you ate this KFC, in two hours, your, your blood sugar and your blood pressure will spike. And if you eat this every week for a month, this is how much shorter your life would be. <laughs> At that point, <laughs> if you're weak, you would, think, you would still think twice. So we don't have that yet. So right? basically, if you had all the money in the world, you would want to give the world guilt. <laughs> Not guilt, <laughs> awareness. Awareness. I know, I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's My a beautiful too. answer. It's something that we... It's something that we totally need. Now, now speaking of which, okay, speaking of, of healthy habits, I remember you mentioning that you have an annual ritual that involves smelling like garlic. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yes, I just did it, actually. So I've done this for four years now. Um, every January, uh, every year, I do this eight-day Ayurvedic detox diet. It's an ancient, it's a thousand-year-old ancient Indian practice. Um, but, but so, so we go through this crazy ritual. Um, every morning I get up, then we would crush seven peppercorn. It has to be exactly seven, so it's good for your dosha. And then you put it in a, a glass of lemon juice and cayenne pepper. Uh, sorry, actually, so you crush the, the peppercorn and eat it with a, a spoon of raw uh, honey. Mm -hmm. And then you drink the, the cayenne pepper, lemon juice. And then you eat a clove of raw garlic, just like that. Um, and then you also take a tablespoon of coconut oil or flaxseed oil. And then you do your, your colon cleanse, your kidney cleanse. You are so Californian. <laughs> yeah, it's very hippie, right? Um, you also do hydrotherapy. Actually, Tim Ferriss, who wrote uh, Four Hour Work Week, mm -hmm. had this in his book, or Four Hour Body, I think, and this is a body hack where you, you go when you shower. This is the best way to clear your headaches, actually. You turn your shower really cold for one minute and then turn it really hot for one minute, and you do it six times it clears your headaches. Because what it does is it expands and contracts your capillaries, mm -hmm. and that helps with your, you get headaches because your blood flow is restricted, right? So when you do that, it really helps with, uh, with your headaches or migraines or anything. So try that. So, so there's this whole routine is really intense, um, and it's for eight days. And the best part of it is that but what, I- what, what do you get from this? Um, so, so I do it with a group of people. So it's accountability, right? So six of my magic staff was crazy enough to do it You shower me. together? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but we did the whole routine together. Got it. And I also had people from New York, San Francisco, um, from other countries doing it with me. Uh, it's really fun to do it as a group. But, but pe people are like, why are you doing it? You don't need to lose any more weight. Um, 
so it's not about losing weight, right? It's about, uh, and some people don't believe in detoxing. Um, I, I like to believe, and I don't know if it's true, but the same way you service your car, uh, why do you service your car? Because all the, the right. gas, the petrol, is, the gunk is stuck in your, your pipe, right? So you do need to sometimes just flush everything out and, and clean all the, flush all the, the toxins in your body. Right, right? detoxing is, is a very important system. Yeah, so your digestive system works all day round, all around the clock. You're eating now, all the time. Now, before we, 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 in a moment, we're going to open the floor to questions from the audience, right? And uh, before we do that, really quickly, I want to ask you two really important things because these are some of the easiest systems that you guys can take away, okay? So really quickly, top three book recommendations and then your top two role models, people that you think others here should pay attention to or follow. Let's start with book recommendations. Oh, wow. I what, haven't... Books, what books would you say were the most defining books of your life? Um... Off the top of my head, I can only think about the recent one I've read, okay. and I wrote about it in the Star. Actually, I, uh, my second column was about difficult conversations. Have you read this book? No, that's the name of the book. Difficult yeah. conversations. Difficult, it's amazing because I think people just don't have enough difficult conversations in their lives. When they tend to disagree or argue about things, they they argue about what you said and what I said. Right? It, it wasn't about the root of the issue, like what caused you to think that way. Again, challenging, you know. Uh, kind of putting yourself in their position and challenging, hmm, that's interesting that you think so differently from me. Why is that? And so often people just don't ask that question. They're just like, oh my gosh, like, why are you such an asshole? Why do you think that way? Why are you so different from me, right? You, you just, you don't like people who are different from you and you think you're right all the time. But if you just flip it a little bit and, and just turn it into a question, that's interesting. Why? Why is that, right? Then you have deeper conversations about, about why. And I think people just tend to avoid conflict. They don't like to be confrontational. That's a, that's a good book, book recommendation. Let's go on yeah. to the second one. Um, the second book recommendation, um, I think they're more entrepreneurial. Um, maybe like Founders at Work. So talking about failure, uh, Founders at Work is a book that documents all the most successful entrepreneurs. Who is the author? Um, it's a, I can't remember the name. But it really tells you the, the stories that you don't hear about. A lot of the, the successful companies ran, went through a lot of pivots, a lot of failures before it got to where it was. So that book was one of the first books I read when I was starting out right. to make me realize that, hey, it's okay to change, right? People do, products do pivot. And the third book that you'd recommend people here read? Oh, I've read a lot of books, but for some reason I can't think of That's okay, let's one. go on to two role models that you think people here should follow. Um, I don't want to say my mom because that's just boring. <laughs> I would actually say Lady Gaga. Oh, Madonna. Okay, this here's why. Um, I was watching. I remember a few years ago. I was watching uh, what mu MTV music videos, mm -hmm. VMA, right? The top five, like historical or the the decade's most popular video. Four out of five were women, women videos. It was like Janet Jackson, Madonna, Lady Gaga, and Beyonce. And then the fifth one, the, it was Jay-Z, I can't remember. So I was like, wow, like four out of five women, right? Why can't we have that in tech? Why can't we have that in, in right. general uh, occupations? But, but in um, entertainment, you get that, right? But anyway, then I zoom in on Lady Gaga and Madonna. They are weird. They are just dead weird. But they stand out, and they're so different and unique. And I guess, for me, the lesson to learn here as an entrepreneur is that dare to be different and dare to be bold, dare to make a statement and be crazy, right? Because yes, she is crazy and you either love her or you hate her, but at least she has people who love her or hate her versus other people who just blend into the background and, and you're, just in, you're just nobody, right? So I guess the lesson for me is, is in life, you, you have to, that's how you reach your height of your potential is if you do something crazy. Otherwise, you're just going to be someone that nobody remembers. Right? So I think that's why like, Lady Gaga is not my actual role model, but, but I think that's But the just, idea of, the of being idea. unusual, being yes. insane, yes. being yourself, and not being not that feeling that different. you need to, to lock yourself in yeah. to just to not be judged is an important idea. Correct, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I just want to say that it's been, it's been an honor interviewing you. Um, I've always thought you're a remarkable person based on your accomplishments. 
but being able to see the real you, to understand how you grew up, what you went through, the challenges, how, you're, how, how you think, my respect for you has just grown so much more. And Aww. as the father of a little girl, a little Malaysian girl, I'm so glad that in Malaysia, we have women like you, so my daughter has someone to look up to in the future. Oh, you're being Thank too you. kind. Thank you.